Thank you for making Locked on Yankees your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms. It's Throwback Thursday. What more is there to say? It's Throwback Thursday. We're going to look back at a couple of Yankee games, random games that I pulled out of thin air. Just kidding. There's actually a method to my madness, and you'll find out next on Locked on Yankees. You are Locked On Yankees, your daily New York Yankees podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Yankee fans. Welcome to Locked On Yankees. It's Thursday, February 10th. I'm recording this very late. I apologize. Today, it's just been a comedy of errors, and uh, which is perfect because, you know, this is a podcast about baseball, and we all watch errors happen, errors happen on during games and everything else. And it is Throwback Thursday. We will get into all of the union stuff on tomorrow's show. Abby will be joining me for tomorrow's show. She couldn't make it today, so I decided to do a throwback Thursday. Before we get into it, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else you can get your podcasts. You can watch us on YouTube. You can subscribe. Please subscribe. Thank you. And if you have a smart device, you can tell it to play Locked on Yankees. So... Throwback Thursday. (laughs) The first game that we're looking at happened because I listened to a song. This is how it, this is how I used to actually do my random box score pieces for the hardball times. In case you don't know, I was a baseball writer before I became a full-time podcast host. And I used to write for a bunch of places. Uh, Hardball Times was one of them, Baseball Prospectus, Fan Rag Sports. I wrote a couple of pieces for ESPN. I'm not saying this to brag. It's just I wrote for a bunch of places years ago. Haven't written full time about baseball in about three years now, and I almost forgot how to do it. So, yeah, I don't even know if I could ever do it again. But when I did, I had a random box score series on the Hardball Times, and what I would do is I had a writing mix. Some writers can't listen to music when they write. I'm one of those people I always have to have music playing no matter what I'm doing. I even play music in the shower. And I had this writing mix. It was made up of mostly 70s and 80s soft rock or light FM songs. And I would hit shuffle and whatever year I would hit, I would pick that year. And then I would just pick a random date to find a game to write about. What happened earlier was I was listening to my Sharona. Now, I knew that song came out in 1979, came out in June, but I don't know the exact date. But I do know the exact date that it first hit number one. It first hit number one for the chart ending on August 25th, because that's how Billboard works. It's the chart, the week ending August 25th, which happened to be the day that I had my fifth birthday party because my birthday was the next day. No one has birthday parties on Sunday. That was the day you went to church. So yeah, it was the day of my birthday party. And the Yankees were in Minnesota at the old Metropolitan Stadium. So this was even before the Twins started playing in the Metrodome. And this stuck out to me. If you follow me on Twitter, you know that I love numbers. I have a thing about double numbers and palindromes and stuff like that. The attendance for that game on Saturday, August 25th, 1979, 36,363. 36363. Pretty cool. The game duration, only two hours, 38 minutes because it was 1979 and games weren't really long slogs like they are now. So it was a night game, and let's go through the lineups, because you know I love doing that. Now, some of these names will not be familiar to a lot of you, because you're young. I get it. But there are a lot of names you will recognize, because it's 1979. It's a year removed from the 78 World Series, and there are whole, you know, carryovers from that year. So you'll you'll recognize some people. Maybe not from the Twins, but from the Yankees, you will. So let's get into the lineup. So the Yankees were the visiting team. Let's go to them first. Willie Randolph, Lenny Randall, Lou Pinella, Reggie Jackson, Chris Chambliss, Greg Nettles, Roy White, Bucky Dent, uh, Brad Guyton. I, 
kind of remember that name. And then Louis Tiant pitching. He wasn't the only Yankee pitcher. We'll get to that in a second. Minnesota Twins. Oh, future Yankee Butch Weiniger. Rob Wilfong. Future Yankee Roy Smoil. Sm- Hello. Roy Smalley. That's not an easy name to say. Try and say it. Uh, Ken Landro. Ron Jackson. Danny Goodwin. Glenn Adams. Hoskin Powell. John Castino. Jerry Kuzmin was the starting pitcher. Okay, there are a few names there that are familiar. The umpires, Jerry Nude, no, New Decker, not Nude Ecker. I don't think that's how you say it. Home plate umpire. Richard Shulock was at first. George Maloney was at second. Jim McKean was at third. I don't remember any of those guys, obviously, because it was 1979. The start time weather, 75. No precip. And the wind was eight miles an hour, but in an unknown direction. So how do they know the miles per hour, but they don't know how the wind was going? Interesting. Interesting. Willie Randolph lined out to left field. And then Glenn Adams, who was playing left field, was replaced by Bombo Rivera. So I don't know if something happened to Glenn Adams on that play. It's possible. That's I've never seen that before. First of all, Bombo Rivera is an awesome name. And second of all, I thought to myself, um, that's very odd that they already have a pinch hitter, <laughs> one batter into the game, and the Twins haven't even gotten up. Lenny Randall hit a fly ball to second. Lou Pinella hit a single to left. And then while Reggie Jackson was up, Lou Pinella got picked off at first. Boo. Tiant set down the Twins 1-2-3 in the first inning. He got Weiniger to strike out looking, Wilfong to ground out to short, Smalley to ground out to second. Now, funny story about Butch Weiniger. I kind of had a crush on him when he was a Yankee. And when I see pictures of him now, I think to myself, really? Butch Weiniger? (laughs) And it's funny because my first... Favorite Yankee player was Greg Nettles. Then it was Butch Weiniger. Then it was Dave Rigetti. Then it was Don Mattingly. And it was Don Mattingly until Derek Jeter came along. Uh, so there was a long <laughs> there was a long time there where Don Mattingly was my number one. But Butch Weiniger? I, I don't know. I can't even explain it. He, he seemed like a good dude, but Butch Weiniger? I don't know. That's embarrassing. So now you all know. Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) top of the second, Reggie Jackson is up because, like I said, Pinella got picked off. He walks. Chris Chambliss hits a single and Jackson advances to third because there was an E9 and Chambliss made it to second. Then Greg Nettles strikes out. Roy White hits into a fielder's choice and Jackson's out at home. The Yankees don't score and Bucky Dent hits a ground out to second. So let's see. There's no scoring here until the top of the third. Brad, Brad, hold on. My eyes are not working. Brad, it's Gildan. That's it. All right. Single to left. Willie Randolph reached on an E1 and he scored from first. And then Randolph got to third because of the E1. Lenny Randall hit a pop fly to first. Lou Pinella hit a ground out to third and Reggie Jackson struck out to end the inning. So it's one nothing Yankees. How exciting. Let's uh, switch gears here for a second. Um, have you given up on your resolutions? Because I know that normally I would, but I'm actually doing pretty good with the working out and eating healthier thing. And I'm sticking to the resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I enjoy eating them. And have you tried their puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, they're not just a protein bar, they're a treat and they're covered in 100% chocolate. They are, they're so good. Puffs are a fan favorite with some incredible flavors. There's a cinnamon churro, that's the best one. I recommend that one. Coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, those are going to be your new favorite thing. Now, all Built Bars, not just the Puffs, are covered in 100% chocolate. 
100% real chocolate. They're low calorie, high protein. They replace your candy bars or replace them with these because they're better for you. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. Go to Built.com, scroll down to the macros chart, and you'll be blown away by all their statistics. Most Built bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has 240 calories, and I cringe every time I read this, 30 grams of sugar. Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They're all delicious and new flavors are coming out all the time. If they think a flavor might be good, they'll make it and it'll be delicious and it'll be good for you. So go to built.com, use our promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off on your first order. Or yeah, your first order. Again, that's LOCKED15 to get 15% off at built.com. It's Super Week, brought to you by Get Upside, and there's no better place to get coverage of the big game than on the Locked On NFL podcast, Locked On Bengals, and Locked On Rams. All three of those podcasts are in L.A. covering the big game, which I heard the forecast is 85 and sunny. I am very jealous because apparently we're going to get cold weather here again in New York. So, I mean, it's winter. Obviously, that's going to happen. But, you know, it was in the 50s the past couple of days, and I saw something about an Arctic blast coming our way. So that's not fun. Speaking of cold weather, usually in Minnesota it's cold weather, but on August 25th, 1979, it was not cold. The bottom of the third was a 1-2-3 for Tiant. Top of the fourth, Kuzman got most of the Yankees out that inning. Roy White hit a single, but it was stuck between a fly ball out to right field, a line out to right field, and a fly ball out to left field. Uh, Tiant set down the Twins 1-2-3 in the fourth. Kuzman uh, set down the Yankees 1-2-3 in the fifth. All three of them were strikeouts. So there was no scoring in this game, aside from the one Yankee run. So from that one run... All the way down to the bottom of the eighth. That's when things fell apart for the Yankees. Bombo Rivera, who had had to be put in the game in the top of the first inning, walked off Tiant, who was still in the game. Hoskin Powell struck out against Tiant. Mike Cubbage pinch hit for John Castino. He hit a triple to center field, which scored Rivera. Then Willie Norwood pinch ran for Cubbage. Butch Weiniger hit a single that scored Norwood. And then Rob Wilfong hit a home run. They scored four runs on four hits. They ended up leaving two on base on the bases because Roy Smalley, let's see, he lined out. Landra walked. Ron Jackson hit a single. And then they finally took Tiant out. <laughs> Why wouldn't you have taken him out after the home run? Actually, I don't know. I, I think I would have taken him out after the triple, but... I wasn't Yankee manager then, and Jim Cott came in to replace Tiant, and he got Jose Morales to hit a fly ball to right field. And then the Yankees came up in the top of the ninth. Bucky Dent hit a single. Bobby Mercer grounded out to second, and then Willie Randolph ended the game on a ground ball double play, and the Yankees lose 4-1. Womp womp. So August 29th, 1979 was not that good for the Yankees. It was good for the Knack, though, because like I said... Their first and only number one hit happened. Now, the Yankees won on... Wait a minute. Why did they not play on my birthday? Did it rain out? That's weird. Because it goes from Saturday, August 25th, 1979 to Monday, August 27th, 1979, which happens to be my friend Amy's birthday, and the Yankees were in Texas playing there. So I guess there was a rain out on my birthday in Minnesota, because again, they were in Minnesota, not in New York. So uh, yeah, that's that's throwback Thursday game number one. And uh, like I said, I got the idea because I heard the song My Sharona, thought of 1979. And you know, 1979 was an interesting year for the Yankees. After that game against Minnesota, they were 70 and 57. So, you know, they were actually pretty okay. But 
They finished 89 and 71. They finished fourth in the AL East. Now, I mean, back then, the AL East was different because it was the East and the West. There was no Central. This is a long time ago. Well, let's just look at this while we're here. Why not? 89 and 71. They came in fourth place. They finished 13 and a half games back. They were in first place for two days. Wow. <laughs> Or no, one day, April 20th. They never led the division. The furthest back that they were were 18 and a half games on September 21st, 1979. They were 18 games back on the last day of the season. The most games under 500 that they were were two on Friday, May 4th. May the 4th be with you. Their longest winning streak was eight. Their longest losing streak was five. The most runs they allowed, 16. The most runs scored, 17. And that happened August 20th. You know what? Let's look at August 20th, 1979. Why not? That's always a fun thing. August, ooh, against the Royals in Kansas City. Oh, all right. So it was a Kansas City, Minnesota, Texas road trip. And then they went home to play Kansas City and Boston. Hmm. And back then, Kansas City and Boston were pretty big rivals for the Yankees. I say this all the time. Um, I was raised to not like the Red Sox and not like the Royals. <laughs> I'm not one of those Yankee fans who was raised to not like the Mets. You know, a lot of people think that, but no. My dad actually, my cousins all grew up on Long Island, and when their parents got divorced, my dad kind of stepped in and helped out. My cousins are a bit older than me. They were mostly teenagers when I was, you know, in preschool. So my dad would take them to Shea Stadium to see the Mets play. So he didn't exactly, he didn't hate the Mets. You know, I, I grew up watching Mets games, especially if the Yankees weren't playing. And so, yeah, I never grew up with a hatred of the Mets. Some people claim that they did, and I don't understand why. The Yankees and the Mets never played back then. They played in those exhibition games that Steinbrenner always took too seriously. But other than that, they never did anything. So for me, you know, like George Brett, no. No liking George Brett. No liking anyone on the Red Sox. Nope, nope, nope. That's what I was taught when I was younger. So I would have been thrilled with this result because the Yankees beat the Royals 17-4 on August 20th, 1979. Yeah, they scored 14 runs combined in the second, third, and fourth inning, and then they tacked on three runs in the eighth inning. Let's just see who... Oh, Tion pitched. Okay. And then Rich Gale pitched for the Royals. Let's just see Gale's line. Oh, no, Gale's not the one that got killed. Okay. He pitched one and two-thirds, gave up five runs, but Steve Mingori came in to relieve him, pitched one and one third, gave up eight runs on nine hits, gave up one home run. Then Marty Patton came in, pitched five innings, gave up four runs, two home runs. Let's see who hit all the home runs for the Yankees. Why not? Bobby Mercer off Mingori. Jim Spencer hit two of them. <laughs> both off. Oh, okay. Both of his home runs were the home runs that Patton gave up. Interesting. Oscar Gamble hit two doubles. Jim Spencer hit a double. Greg Nettles hit. Wow. Jim Spencer had himself quite a game. Jim Spencer, three for four with five runs batted in and four runs scored. <sighs> Good for you. That's, that's a hell of a day for the Yankees in 1979. I vaguely remember Jim Spencer. So we're coming up on the Super Bowl, people. We're only a few days away, and Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march through the playoffs right to the big game. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just football. BetOnline has up-to-the-minute info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, along with live, real-time updates of current games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. BetOnline, where the game starts. 
Once again, thank you for listening to Locked on Yankees. Thank you for watching. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. The uh, closer we get to 1,000, the better it is. We're somewhere in the 730s. I think our next, our next big number is 750. And then after that, Barry Bonds' home run total. I mean, why not? So uh, what was the other game I was going to do? I was so engrossed in this other... <laughs> in this game. Oh, you know what I wanted to mention? As I was looking at this game on August 29th, 1979, I happened to glance at the scores for the other games that were going on in baseball. And there weren't a lot. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 games. The California Angels beat the Toronto Blue Jays 24 to two. I kind of want to look at this. I know we're a Yankee podcast, but 24 to two. That's, that's crazy. Okay. Oh, they scored. <laughs> the Angels scored 24 runs on 26 hits. They scored in every inning except the seventh and the ninth. They scored eight runs in the first inning, three in the second, two in the third, three in the fourth, one in the fifth. Oh, that's kind of low for them. Five in the sixth, two in the eighth. And the poor Blue Jays scored one run in the first and one run in the second. They also had three errors, so that didn't really help either. But wow. Oh, all right. California was 71 and 58 and Toronto was 44 and 88 because they were babies at that, that time, right? Toronto only came into the league, when was it, 1977? So they were still a nascent team. They were in their infancy stage so i don't think people were really expecting them to do much now where is this at oh it was at exhibition stadium exhibition stadium was infamous for being like literally on lake ontario and being really windy and just awful i know people who went to concerts there who said the concerts were great although you still had to bundle up there were maybe like two months that you didn't have to bundle up at exhibition stadium july and august but all the other months you had to because it was on the lake. If you're by any type of big water area, you know, um, I was on the opposite side of the lake in college in Oswego. And let me tell you, the wind was crazy. Oswego's campus is right on the lake. I could have thrown something out my window. and It could have gone into the lake. That's how close we were. And that's how close Exhibition Stadium was pretty much to Lake Ontario on the opposite side. So, yeah, it was pretty chilly for people in Ontario when they went to baseball games. And, you know, when Sky Dome opened up, native Torontonians don't like calling it Rogers Center because they don't like the Rogers Corporation. So they still call it Sky Dome. Fun fact for you. And... When that first opened up, the whole idea of it having a roof, a retractable roof, where they wouldn't have to be cold in those months that they were normally cold at Exhibition Stadium. So, yeah, that was a big reason why that happened. I still think the Yankees should have had a retractable roof on their new stadium, and it was stupid. The Mets, too. There's no reason why the Mets didn't. They have all that room in the parking lot. They could have had something hanging over like they did in... Um, I think they did it in Arlington, right? With the new stadium that replaced a 25-year-old stadium. Don't get me started on that. I ranted about it. Was it last year when I ranted about that? And I ranted about Atlanta trading in their stadiums for younger models. And how Texas was always in a place where it was hot. And they knew that when they built it in the 90s. So why wouldn't you put a roof on it then? Anyway. Ugh. <laughs> oh fun times um you know we're not going to go into another game let's discuss we're going to discuss something kind of heavy here and um because i feel like it needs to be mentioned the news came out yesterday that jeremy giambi passed away which is a big bummer jason played for the yankees jeremy giambi was involved in the flip play unfortunately for him that's like the most infamous play of his career because he was on the losing end of it you know um, I know a lot of people still think he was safe. He probably was, but I think the ump probably called him out because he was a dumbass for not sliding. But this was a bummer of a news update when I saw that yesterday. He's my age. He's 47. And to hear that he passed away and then the news came out. 
how he passed away. And that's even more upsetting when you hear about that. And I just feel really bad for his family and his friends and especially Jason. You know, those guys were close and that's just a really hard thing to go through. And I send my condolences and thoughts to the Giambi family and to all of Jeremy Giambi's former teammates. You know, Barry Zito said some cool things about him and um, other guys said some things. You know, he played in a few places, um, not just Oakland. He played with Boston. He played with Philly. And yeah, it's just a big bummer. That was that was upsetting news. And then Bernie Williams posted a really sweet picture of him and Gerald Williams. You know what? I'm going to read the caption because it was really, really nice. And it made me cry. Can I admit that? I'll admit it. It made me cry. I um, I don't mean to be so sensitive, but, you know, you don't expect the news of Gerald Williams passing away. That was really shocking. So he posted a very sweet picture of himself and Gerald with Bernie's father in between the two of them. And it says, I'm still coping with the passing of Gerald Williams, but came across this old photo, which made me smile and means so much more now. This was taken in spring training in the early 90s in the old Yankees facility in Fort Lauderdale. We had our lockers next to each other. And in the middle is my mom, is my mom, is my dad. He loved Gerald and it comforted dad knowing we had each other on and off the field here can you see it it's so sweet I feel so bad you know um Tino had some nice things to say about Gerald Williams on the Players Tribune post um Charlie Jeter you know because as I said on yesterday's show Gerald Williams really took Derek Jeter under his wing and he protected him he was a big brother figure for him there the entire rest of his life um and as i said he was at Derek jeter's hall of fame induction that was the last time we all saw him and it was just really sad to find that out and then you know back to back days gerald williams and then jeremy giambi and you know they're both young gerald williams was only 55 55 is not old you know and it's just so sad that he died of cancer and it's sad that jeremy giambi passed the way passed away the way they're saying he passed away and you know, as someone who attempted, I'll just say that, I know how he felt. I couldn't go through with it, though. But I knew how he felt. You just feel like you just don't want to feel anything anymore. And it's just a big bummer. So I really hope that his family gets through this. And I hope that people aren't going to be prying into it. Also, I, I really hope that people don't ever... Unless Jason opens up about it, but don't, please don't, dear Lord, because, you know, people don't think about that sort of thing and they say things and just really, no, don't. And this is for people who are in journalism and people who were, you know, just don't ask him about it, please. You know, mm, no, just don't. Um, I don't want to end the show on a note like that. Um, tomorrow, me and Abby will be reacting to what rob manfred said today i don't know what's going on with that guy i can't tell if he's trying to make us all think that things are going to be okay and then when the meeting happens on saturday if things don't go the way they're supposed to go that the owners will try and flip it around on the players <laughs> i know that's a bad way to think but that's how i'm thinking right now guys just get this done okay please just get it done even if you have to miss a couple days of spring training, just get it done and start the season on time. It'll just be good for everyone. And I'm talking to the owners, not the players. The players have been doing negotiating in good faith. The, the owners have not. They haven't. And like I said, Saturday could be bad. It could be very bad. Um, you know, and it better last more than an hour and a half, like the last meeting they had, because that's just ridiculous. There's too much for them to work out. And, oh, one more thing, Universal DH. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, one quick thing about that. My brother has an idea. You know how they did the thing in the All-Star game with Shohei Otani, where they allowed him to pitch and hit, but then they allowed the American League to have the DH. They didn't have to put pitchers in that position. My brother thinks that they should always do that. They shouldn't have to force pitchers to hit. Like if a pitcher wants to hit, he should be allowed to hit. And then if he's taken out, you could just put a DH in there, like a normal DH. 
I kind of like that idea. And I was actually thinking of that on my own. But I think that they should do that. And m maybe, I don't know, who do I talk to about that? To get that implemented. And then take away the Ghost Runner on second in the 10th inning. That's gone, right? Didn't they say that was gone? Oh, no, it's not gone. Ugh. Anyway, and no sudden death either, because I know that they're playing around with that in the lower levels. No, no, no. Mm -mm. No, it's not. We're not playing football. We're not playing basketball. We're not playing hockey. It's baseball. There should not be sudden death. Okay, thank you. Let's not do that. So that's it for this episode of Locked On Yankees, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'd like to remind you that you can listen to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can watch and subscribe to us on YouTube. And when you get into your car, you can tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Bets. Now make your second listen of the day Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. One more thing, if you could be so kind, please rate the podcast and spread the word about this podcast to your fellow Yankee fans. We'd really appreciate it. Enjoy your Thursday, and we will talk to you tomorrow.